Hello and welcome to the presentation on probability and statistics, which will give you an introduction to some of the basic knowledge and skills that we need for a dam or levee risk analysis. At the conclusion of this presentation, you should be able to do three things. The first is to recognize some of the commonly used terms, definitions, and notations. Second is to apply the basic theory and concepts as a participant in a risk analysis. And third is the ability to perform some of the basic calculations needed to quantify a risk estimate. In this presentation, we will be exploring some of the ways that set theory, probability theory, statistics, and the Monte Carlo method can be used to support a risk analysis. A strong foundation can greatly improve our understanding and communication of the risks associated with dams and levees. Set theory provides a basis for defining and describing the events that make up a risk analysis. Probability theory provides the math and calculations needed to quantify a risk estimate. Statistics helps us to deal with the collection, analysis, and interpretation of information and data. Set theory can be used to identify and describe the relationships between the events that make up a risk analysis. Events can be numerical, such as the estimated number of fatalities, or they can be categorical, such as the event of the dam failing or not failing. Venn diagrams can be used as a graphical tool to portray and communicate the events in a risk analysis. Here are just a few examples of the types of events that you will encounter in a risk analysis. An individual event describes one specific outcome. A potential failure mode can be defined by a collection of individual events that lead to failure. A set of collectively exhaustive events describes all of the possible outcomes. A risk analysis needs to consider all of the events that can make a significant contribution to the risk estimate. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot occur at the same time. It is important that the risk estimate is built upon a set of unique hazard, system response, and consequence events. Here are just a few of the event relationships that are commonly used in a risk analysis. The complement of an event means that the event does not occur. Complementary events are mutually exclusive and also collectively exhaustive. The intersection of two or more events means that all of the events occur. A potential failure mode is made up of the intersection of a collection of all the events that must occur to result in a failure. The union of two or more events means that the events can occur individually or together. The total risk estimate for a dam or levy comes from the union of two or more potential failure modes. Combinations help us to count and list the various outcomes that can occur when the order of the events does not matter. In this example, we can use the binomial coefficient to calculate the number of ways that two gate failures can occur for a dam that has three spillway gates. There are a total of eight possible combinations that are listed in the table on the right-hand side with three of those combinations corresponding to the outcome of two spillway gate failures. We'll pause for a moment to give you a chance to look at the eight combinations. Permutations are used to count and list all of the various possible outcomes that can occur when the order of the events does matter. In this example, we can use the binomial coefficient from the previous slide combined with the permutation formula to calculate the number of ways that two failures can occur for a river system that has two dams and one levee. In this example, we are assuming that the consequences and thus the risk estimate depend on which dam or levee fails first. There are a total of 16 possible permutations listed in the table on the right with six of those permutations corresponding to an outcome of two failures. We'll pause here for a moment to give you a chance to explore the 16 combinations.
Probability theory gives us the mathematical framework needed to quantify a risk estimate. It includes estimating the likelihood that an event will occur, the likelihood that our judgment is correct, and the calculations that we need to combine these probabilities to form a risk estimate. Venn diagrams can be used to portray events and their probabilities by scaling the size of the event to its probability. All of the methods and formulas that we use to estimate and combine probabilities for a risk estimate come from these three fundamental probability rules. The first two rules tell us that every probability must be a numerical value between 0 and 1. The third rule provides the basis for all of the calculations that we use to combine probabilities in an event tree analysis. There are two interpretations of probability that you will need to use in a risk analysis. An objective probability is calculated directly from data. This data can be observed in the real world or it can be simulated in an experiment or in a model. A subjective probability is estimated by a rational weighting of the available evidence based on your personal experience and judgment. Subjective probabilities reflect your willingness to take a particular action or to not take an action based on your degree of belief in the evidence. In a risk analysis, events are statistically dependent when the occurrence of one event affects the probability estimates for the other events. The events that make up a potential failure mode, including the hazard, the system response, and the consequences are typically assumed to be statistically dependent in a risk analysis. This means that the probability of an event is estimated assuming that all of the predecessor events have occurred. A risk analysis uses conditional probability estimates to deal with statistical dependence. A conditional probability is the probability that an event will occur given that some other event has occurred or is assumed to have occurred. The notation P of A followed by the vertical bar symbol in B means the probability estimate for event A occurring given that event B has already occurred. Events are statistically independent if the occurrence of one event does not change the probability estimate for the other events. The probabilities for individual potential failure modes are typically estimated assuming that the potential failure modes are statistically independent. In most cases, but not necessarily every case, this is a reasonable simplifying assumption for a risk analysis. The rule of subtraction is commonly used in risk analysis and in event tree analysis to calculate the probability for a complementary event. For example, the probability for the non-failure event must be equal to 1 minus the probability of the failure event. Similarly, the probability of successful intervention must be equal to 1 minus the probability of unsuccessful intervention. The probability for the intersection of events is calculated using the rule of multiplication. It is commonly used in risk analysis to calculate the probability of failure and the risk estimate for potential failure mode by multiplying the probabilities of all the events along the event tree pathway that make up the failure mode. In this example, the probability of failure would be equal to the probability of spillway flow multiplied by the probability of erosion occurring given that spillway flow has occurred. The rule of addition is used in risk analysis to calculate the probability for the union of events. The total probability of failure and the total risk estimate are calculated by summing the probability of failure and the risk over all of the end branches of an event tree. When the events are not mutually exclusive, an adjustment must be made to account for the probability of the intersection event shown in the Venn diagram as the overlapping area and in the equation as the probability of A times the probability of B. This is the probability that both events occur. The equation for the rule of addition from the previous slide can get rather complicated when there are more than two events. De Morgan's rule provides us with a simpler way to perform these calculations. 
The calculation can be explained in three easy steps. First, we calculate the probability of the non-failure event for each potential failure mode as one minus the probability of failure. Next, we calculate the total probability of the non-failure event by multiplying these probabilities together. The final step is to calculate the total probability of the failure event as one minus the total probability of the non-failure event. Correlation describes the statistical relationship between two variables. Correlation does not necessarily mean that there is a direct cause and effect relationship between them. It can be used in a Monte Carlo analysis to model the relationships between input variables. It is also commonly used to make predictions about the value of a parameter based on the value of some other parameter. Pearson's coefficient is commonly used to measure linear correlation. A low correlation implies randomness. A positive correlation implies that the parameters tend to move in lockstep, which means that a low value for A typically corresponds to a low value for B. A negative correlation implies that a low value for A would typically correspond to a high value for B. Correlation can affect the estimated total probability for the union of events. When the events have perfect positive correlation, unimodal bounds tells us that the total probability will equal the largest of the individual probabilities. When the events are uncorrelated, the total probability is equal to the value calculated by applying De Morgan's rule. In a risk analysis, the uncorrelated case is typically assumed. When one event has a much greater probability than all of the other events, the upper and lower bounds will be about the same value. Random variables are used in a risk analysis to model uncertain events and parameters. The likelihood of a particular event, a parameter value, or a range of parameter values is quantified by a probability estimate. There are two types of random variables found in risk analysis. A discrete random variable has a countable set of values, such as the number of spillway gates intervention being either successful or unsuccessful, or the levy either breaching or not breaching. A continuous random variable has an infinite set of possible values, such as the annual maximum spillway flow or a system response probability for a failure mode. Take a moment to review some of the examples listed on the slide. We use probability distributions to summarize and visualize the possible values of a random variable along with their corresponding probabilities. Discrete random variables are portrayed using either a probability mass function or a cumulative distribution function. The probability mass function tells us the probability of a specific value of the random variable. The cumulative distribution function tells us the probability that the value of the variable is less than or equal to a particular value. Continuous random variables are portrayed using either a probability density function or a cumulative distribution function. Note that the probability for a specific value is undefined for a continuous random variable. We can only calculate and report the probability for a range between two values, which is calculated as the area under the probability density function. This is one of the reasons why a hazard curve must be divided into loading intervals for an event tree analysis. The cumulative distribution tells us the probability that the variable is less than or equal to a particular value. It can also be used to calculate the probability of a range between any two values. An exceedance curve or a survival function is the complement of the cumulative distribution function the exceedance curve tells us the probability that the variable will be greater than a particular value. Flood hazard curves, seismic hazard curves, and the big FN plot are some examples of exceedance curves. This is why we use the term exceedance in the phrase annual exceedance probability. Random variables can also be summarized using descriptive statistics that tell us something about the characteristics of the probability distribution. The mean, median, and mode 
are all measures of the tendency of the variable. The mean is the first moment or the centroid of the probability distribution and is the value that will occur on the average. The median divides the distribution into two equally likely parts, meaning that half of the values will be greater than the median and half of the values will be less than the median. The mode is the value that has the greatest probability of occurring, which means that this value has the highest probability density on the probability distribution. It is the value that is most likely to occur. The variance is the second moment or the moment of inertia of the probability distribution and measures the uncertainty or dispersion of the variable. The standard deviation, which is probably more commonly used, is calculated as the square root of the variance. The coefficient of variation gives us a relative measure of the uncertainty by dividing the standard deviation by the mean. The skew is the third moment of the probability distribution and measures the symmetry of the values. Positively skewed distributions will have a tail to the right, which you can see in the example shown in the figure. And negatively skewed distributions will be the mirror image with a tail to the left of the distribution. Here are just a few examples of the probability distributions that you will encounter in a risk analysis. There are many, many more. The uniform distribution is a two-parameter bounded distribution where all of the values within a range have the same probability. It's commonly used to generate random numbers in a Monte Carlo analysis. The PERT distribution is a three-parameter bounded distribution where the most likely value is used to define the shape of the distribution. The PERT distribution is commonly used to model the uncertainty and probability estimates that come from an expert elicitation. The normal distribution is an unbounded two-parameter distribution defined by the mean and the standard deviation. It shows up frequently because of the central limit theorem. The log normal distribution is a two-parameter distribution that has a lower bound at zero and no upper bound. The distribution is defined by a mean and a standard deviation of the logarithms of the data. This distribution also shows up relatively frequently because of the central limit theorem. The Weibull distribution is commonly used for time-dependent reliability analysis. Failures during the early warranty period can be modeled with a shape parameter less than one. Random failures that occur during the service life can be modeled with a shape parameter equal to one. And age-related wear-out failures at the end of the service life can be modeled with a shape parameter greater than one. There are many other distributions from which to choose. A key concept in risk analysis is to select a distribution that is consistent with the physical characteristics of the thing you are modeling and also consistent with the available data. Bayesian inference is an important concept in statistics and especially important when it comes to estimating subjective probabilities for a risk analysis. The goal is to weigh the available evidence in a rational way based on the value of the information provided by each piece of evidence while minimizing the cognitive bias or the systematic errors in thinking that naturally occur when people process information and try to estimate probabilities. Bayes' theorem can be used to correctly weigh new evidence when updating a probability estimate. The calculation requires an initial estimate of the probability called a prior probability and estimates of the conditional and total probability of encountering the new evidence. The updated or the posterior probability estimate can then be calculated using Bayes' theorem. Here is a simple example of a probability estimate calculated using Bayes' theorem. We start with an initial estimate of 0.2 for the probability of a permeable layer. Next, we gather new evidence with an exploration program and estimate the conditional and total probability of our findings based on the boring spacing and the estimated average size of the permeable layer. We can then plug these probabilities into Bayes' theorem to estimate an updated probability of 0.13. Notice that the probability estimate does not go to zero simply because we did not find a layer. 
the calculation helps us to correctly weigh the evidence, accounting for the fact that there is still some probability that a layer does exist and that we just didn't find it because our borings were not spaced closely enough. The Monte Carlo method is used in risk analysis to estimate uncertainty. Here's a brief overview of how it works. First, we build a deterministic model or an event tree that calculates something like a peak reservoir stage, a factor of safety, a system response probability, a life loss estimate, or a risk estimate. Next, we assign probability distributions to define the uncertainty in the model inputs. The model inputs are then sampled according to their probability distributions, and for each sample of the model inputs, we calculate and record the model results. By repeating this process many times, we get many samples of the model results, which can then be used as an estimate of the uncertainty in the output of the model, such as the uncertainty in a risk estimate. This method can be applied and used with any deterministic model to perform an uncertainty analysis. One of the key concepts used in the Monte Carlo method is inverse transform sampling. This is how the input parameters of the model are sampled according to their probability distributions. First, we generate a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1, as shown in the example using the rand function in Excel. Next, we apply the random number to the cumulative distribution function for the variable, as shown in the example on the right-hand side using the norm inverse function in Excel, assuming that this input is normally distributed. The figures show the results after repeating this for 1,000 samples. You can see that the sampled random numbers reproduced the normal distribution for the model input parameter. The normal and log normal distributions tend to show up in the results of a Monte Carlo analysis because of the central limit theorem. In a risk analysis, this happens because probabilities and risk estimates are summed across the end branches of an event tree and multiplied along the pathways of an event tree. This is the same reason why some variables tend to have a normal distribution. The uncertainty comes from the accumulation or the summation of multiple sources of uncertainty and multiple sources of error in the measurements. The law of large numbers tells us that the Monte Carlo method will eventually converge to the true or correct answer over a large number of simulations. Even simple models, like the coin toss example shown in the figure, require hundreds of simulations for convergence. Models used in a risk analysis typically need thousands to upwards of millions of simulations in order to achieve adequate convergence. We'll finish up the presentation with one miscellaneous tip that can be useful in a risk analysis. Models and event trees that use discrete input functions such as defining the system response curve by only a few points, have to rely on interpolation, usually linear interpolation, to calculate intermediate values. A general objective of any model is to minimize any unnecessary sources of error in the calculations. Selecting the most appropriate linear approximation to a function can greatly improve the accuracy of a value that is estimated by linear interpolation. In the example shown, the system response curve points suggest a normal distribution. By using the standard normal deviate or the z value to linearize this system response curve, the accuracy of interpolated values can be significantly improved. Here are some key takeaways for any risk analysis. First, risk analysis should not be treated as a black box. Second, Remember that the formulas are exact, but the assumptions and the inputs to the risk model are uncertain. Understanding the fundamentals of probability and statistics will help you to build better risk models, make better assumptions and simplifications in your risk models, and calculate risk estimates that are more credible.